it again here. Okay. It is awesome to be together with you folks. And I'm not anticipating any travel and hopefully, hopefully there won't be further health disruptions. Um, so um, hopefully we can be together on an ongoing basis uh, going forward. I'm so grateful to Cheyenne for taking the lead. Um, but you're going to have to put up with me for for this section and maybe on Thursday as well, taking the lead for the for the class, just to 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 give less less on uh, Cheyenne to have to worry about on her plate for this week. Um, and <clears throat> it's quite an honor to be able to serve in this capacity, particularly because we're going to be talking about some topics that lie at the heart of the goals of the class. Um, and indeed, the broader enterprise of com compositional, and categorical uh, simulation and modeling. Um, and we're going to see kind of um, almost from a philosophical standpoint, some of the impulses that that category theory uh, uh, directs us with. Um, but also some of the basic mechanisms like the, the widgets or gadgets that category theory gives us to lead this, to, to, to sort of build up these structures and realize the goals, realize those philosophical goals, um, that, that perspective. Okay, so I'm gonna, with that preface, I'm gonna share my screen. Can you see my screen? Okay, and I would note that I have, I have posted these slides and I've also posted a Jupyter notebook that we will be using um, and likely we'll make significant use of it today, if not on Thursday for sure, okay? But we're gonna try to interplay <clears throat> um, some of the hands-on with with the, the theory here, okay? And this, this lecture is going to go a bit deeper into to theory, um, but also it's going to, you know, sort of uh, uh, rise to the atmospheric heights in terms of, of, of philosophy. So arrayed before us are a set of structures that all of you will know and possibly love. <laughs> you know, these are the, the elements of our craft, right? These are the the types of, um, of, of uh, uh, structures and, and that we we uh, accompany our lab and that that by which we ply our craft of uh, delivering value for insight and trade off between decision making and, I'm, and of course I'm showing um, formalisms uh, showing syntaxes drawn from different areas of modeling from uh, system dynamics with uh, causal loop diagrams, with system structure diagrams, with stock and flow diagrams, but also from a discrete event simulation. Many of you will recognize this, right? And from, um, uh, from common mechanisms used in agent-based like state charts, right? Now, if 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 you take a look, I haven't chosen these uh, by accident. Beyond their sort of breadth and span of these areas, um, or these traditions, I've also drawn several of these to to communicate that we're kind of putting things together. Um, so you'll notice up here, there's a whole bunch of of state charts, maybe some involving, um. Uh, tobacco related use right here um some involving uh stages of uh of TB right here um or stages of of uh, uh diabetes or what have you and you'll notice that they share a certain element here the the final state right um or in this discrete event simulation we have some actual hierarchical components so there's a although you can't see it here explicitly, this little block or this block actually represents a whole subprocess, a whole workflow that, that is placed inside here, okay? Um, and of course, while I don't show it, we're all familiar with that with the fact that causal loop diagrams drawn independently can be 
put next to each other or or stuck together. Um, and indeed, we can take a diagram like uh, SIT involving the SIRS model, and we can put alongside it something that accumulates cumulative illnesses and have a link here and sort of link them up, right? Um, and you'll notice that all of these have, at, at a certain level, an element of networks, right? Things connected to others, right? whether it's it's the links of a causal loop diagram or the links and flows of a system structure diagram or a, um, a uh, stock and flow diagram or the transitions of a um, of a uh, state chart or or these um, transitions associated with discrete event all of them have this sort of network structure this is a set of pieces and we connect them up and and often then we can put those bigger blocks, whether it's a whole state chart or whether it's a DES system that we can put as a sub piece of another, or we hitch up, you know, uh, one stock flow model to another, we can kind of put them together. Do you get that sense? Into a bigger piece, into a bigger structure. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and category theory as, a, as an enterprise has, has uh, I understand from from those in it has long emphasized um, insights um, into these sort of open systems. I say open systems because once we build up a piece, it has the ability to be stuck together with another piece, either side by side or maybe input output. Right? Maybe we 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 have. Um, this link here that can go down to this flow, right? Um, so values from here go down to there, or or maybe it's composition, maybe it's hierarchical composition, so we can sort of substitute in a, a piece here. Um, all of them have this ability to like be stuck together. These open systems, that's what makes them open. They have these kind of mechanisms, these interfaces. I think I've heard John Bice refer to them as handles on the system. So we have a system more broadly. But then we have these ports or these gateways or these plugs uh, into that system. Um, and I think, you know, with a bit of thinking, you'll you'll recognize the ubiquity of this, right? Um, so we all have these little gadgets that much of our life, you know, is involved with, right? I could stick in this uh, HDMI thing into the end, and I'm converting something where my computer is an HDMI port to something now where it has, because they're stuck together, a port that's a VGA port, right? Or even plugging my laptop into the wall. I've, I've, I've now got um, the ability to plug that cord into my, my laptop. So we have a lot of these, these components, but they're compositional. And this is what I'm, I want to, want to, want to emphasize here. It's, it's by plugging this in to my computer that um, I go from my computer having one sort of output port now to having you know, an HDMI set, now to having a VGA set. It's the fact that the two are put together, it alters what interfaces are available. It's a bigger whole. It's now, instead of just being my computer, it's my computer and this thing and its ports are somewhat different, but they're stuck together into a bigger whole. Do you get that point? And again, I, I think all of us are familiar with the fact that our lives are arranged around that, whether it's USB cords or, you know, for for video um, or or power, even just in the IT domain, but in many other domains, right? This, this idea of taking these pieces that can be stuck together, sticking them together and getting a bigger hole that can then be stuck together with other things. Mm -hmm. This is... You know, category theorists see this and they recognize compositionality, right? You stick two things together, you get something bigger, which which can be stuck together with other things. It should remind you of composing morphisms, right? F and G compose together to get H, which is bigger. And F goes from A to B, G goes from B to C, and now H, the composition of them goes from F to, to H, right? Uh, from from sorry a to to c excuse me yeah. um a to c okay um so the motivation in many ways for 
the remainder of the course, and certainly this area of the course, it consists of representing these open systems. Good engineering does this anyway, right? Like in engineering, we separate interface from implementation, right? We have, when we have large systems, we have interfaces to them. Maybe they're human interfaces. Maybe they're interfaces that are hardware in nature. Maybe they're software interfaces involving, you know, HTTP um, uh, ports that are open, right? Um, so we see this principle that we see throughout life and open systems woven into our IT systems. And what we're going to be talking about here is ways of achieving that, okay? Um, we know from engineering, we know from just our life in the daily world that it's useful to have these handles on these systems in the world. Um, and we've seen hints of it, haven't we? Like when I last was with you, I think, physically, we spoke about gluing together structures with with this ability to take a co-limit in the form of a push-out. Do you remember that? Where we could identify like vertices on a graph. Um, and, uh, you know, we have one graph, graph A, graph B, and we identify vertices they have in common and we glue them together. Do you remember that? But that didn't give us a general way of having handles on these graphs. It didn't expose interfaces that could be reused and, and, plugged together with many things. Instead, it was kind of a bespoke operation, and it didn't really give us a way to think about composition more generally, about stitching these things together like morphisms in a category, one after the other, each composing, like we get with, with these sort of devices, in fact. Um, uh, so here, we're going to be talking about a mechanism, a structure of co-spans that will give us that compositionality, will give us this ability to treat open systems, get this, not merely as objects, but also as morphisms and, and stick them together. And it turns out that in, 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 in their formal representation chain category theory, that's exactly what they are. They, they are objects at once, um, and morphisms uh, in another sense. And, and we'll eventually come to that in our group. But for right now, we're going to focus on them being morphisms, okay? Um, but don't don't forget the fact that they are first and foremost, you know, um, open systems. They're, they're kind of, they serve also as objects in a, in a way, right? Um, and we're going to show this widget, this gadget of a structured co-span to achieve this. Okay, and unlike just kind of the bespoke gluing together of things around, around particular say graphs around vertices or stock flow di or stock flow diagrams around common stocks or causal loop diagrams around common vertices. Instead of that, we're going to have these ways of exposing these ports on these systems. And if the system goes from a, a input port A to output port B, and it allows it goes from input port B to an output port C, and you compose them, what do you get? You tell me, A to C. You get that idea? It's it's going to follow, like um, you know, uh, the dawn follows the rising of the sun. Okay, okay, okay. So we're going to be dealing with these things called structured cospans, and Chagan. In this room, on this very board, she introduced these a bit last time, I think, right? And she she had motivated that, or or she had built up your understanding with co-spans, plain co-spans. And then she spoke about structured co-spans, okay? And um, these include like a co-span, right? Um, two feet and an apex. And then legs that go, as we call them, from the feet to the apex, right? So this is the apex here, right? Now, um, she and I talked, um, uh, and uh, you know, we we discussed the fact that although she gave original reference to these being these these constructs here, L and R being adjoint functors being part of an adjunction she said she didn't really 
mention what that was. She didn't have that chance. She only was able to get to these in the last you know, 10, 20 minutes or something. Um, so today we're going to, and maybe Thursday too, we're going to be talking about this thing of adjunction. And it turns out to be really interesting, really powerful, really general, and really important in this case. Okay. Um, and you, you'll notice that these structured co-spans are kind of shown in two forms here. Um, one where we kind of have L, um, we, 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 well, maybe I'll start with this one. This one, we have A and B, which are the feet. Um, and then uh, R of X is the apex. Or we can have X as the apex, and we can hit L, L with a uh, a functor, and, R, and B with a, oh, sorry, A with a functor, and uh, B with a functor, and get L of A and L of B down here. And this may all seem very mysterious to you, but there's a deep reason why these are basically two faces of this thing they you can phrase it in this way or you can phrase it in that way given the nature of rnl and right now it would just be a bunch of words i could talk about l being a left adjoint right r being a right adjoint but we're going to be talking about what that means okay and um this will be this will be introducing some notions that have huge applicability across supply category theory including some of the foremost applications of applied category theory in functional program with monads, what are called monads. Okay, um, so we're going to talk here about two categories. This is going to be a tale of two categories, A and X, okay? A will be a category associated with these feet, A, and this little A, is in category A, B is in category B. Um, oh, sorry, category A, excuse me. And, and this co-span is in fact shown in category A. So there's gonna be a category A, which is kind of a simpler category. It's the category characterizing the interface, okay? So the interface will be characterized by a category. Some, a lot of the time it will be a very familiar category, okay? It'll be a category, um, involving uh, sets, okay? Um, meanwhile, there's a, a richer category called X, okay? And X will be the category associated with the apex. It's gonna have, it's gonna be richer. It's gonna have more, as John says, bells and whistles. It's gonna have more stuff it can represent. So maybe, let, let me give you an example. Stock and flow diagram, these sort of things here. Maybe our apex will have, that's the rich category X. Maybe it will have the ability to represent, you know, stocks and flows and, and these kind of links between things and, and constants, right? Maybe that will be X. It can represent all these things. Whereas the feet might only be able to represent stocks, just stocks, because maybe you can only identify when you glue these together, maybe you can only say S in this one is the same as S in that one. You can't say, maybe, you know, we can't say this flow is the same as that one. No, maybe we limit ourselves to just saying this stock is the same as that. This stock in, in, uh, uh, in stock and flow diagram A is the same as this other stock in, 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 um, system, in stock and flow diagram B. And we identify, if we don't need to identify constants, if we don't need to identify dynamic variables or auxiliary variables, calculations on uh, and flows, then we'll leave them out of, of A, okay? The simpler one. The simpler one just describes what's on the tip. It's kind of like with this little thing here, there may be all sorts of electronics in here, but really, you know, this is a much simpler thing. It's it's mostly a mechanical interface with some connectivity. It doesn't have all sorts of fancy electronics in this little thing here. Is that okay? Or the little bits of holes here. They don't have, you know, fancy electronics. The fancy electronics is kind of in the apex. Okay. Um, so A is going to be simple. X is going to be complex. Okay. They're not going to be solitudes, as we say. But imagine we have a category A, and we're 
you can match in category A, okay? Just, just orient yourself in this. Category A, A, these are the objects of A and these are the morphisms of, of A, okay? I'm, I'm, I'm emphasizing this because later we're gonna come to a category, looks a bit like it, where these are the objects of A and the morphisms there, won't be the morphisms of A, they'll be structured co-spans between these things. It'll be a different category where the objects are the same, but the morphisms are interpreted differently. Um, and double categories will combine both, but we'll not get to that. So, so imagine this. Imagine, imagine that, like for example, that simpler interface, the one in the, in the, in the associated with the feet. Maybe it's a CSAT. You could imagine that, right? And and these are objects are are instances of a CSAT, and 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 these morphisms are mappings between these CSAT instances, which are CSAT homomorphisms. Do you remember that? Like homomorphisms between dynamical systems or homomorphisms between graphs or homomorphisms between that little agent-based one that, that we looked at, right? Um, these could be different types of CSATs. Are we comfortable with that? Okay. And you'll remember that we there's another one that's just a category of sets and functions, right? Where you, you remember this, right? Because we're going to be using it a lot. I just want you to be on the same page where the objects are sets, Right, one of the objects is Larissa will will remind us has an elephant in it, a single elephant, and the other is a professor and the elephant. Um, right, and the op what are the morphisms in this category? They're functions. They're functions between sets. Are we okay with that? Okay. Now, okay. Um, so to understand structured cospans better we're going to need to go a level down, okay? We're going to need to talk and square ourselves with this matter, this adjoint thing, because it's kind of funky terms, and I want you to understand what it means. But the truth is, it'll give you a glimpse of beauty, too, and of something of profound power. Okay, so the basic metaphor that I find really helpful with that junction basic slogan is adjunctions are like translations between categories. A way of translating between two similar categories. Okay? we It turns out in category theory, you can't really talk about two categories being equal amongst other things. I mean, objects are just these just these you know, little dots. We can't really say, are they the same object or not? What we can talk about is categories that have similar structure. And, and adjunctions get into this because there's an adjunction between categories if they have, if they share a lot of the same structure. We're going to get quite precise what that means. But hold that notion in your mind. Adjunctions about translations between categories, and they only exist if those categories have a lot of common types of structure. And so you can, you could say, well, this structure over in this category corresponds to that structure over in that other category, okay? So that's, that's the basic idea. And how we define that they are similar categories um, and, and, and that there's an adjunction between them, it's, it has this nice balance between what you can do with it, the power, but the generality, how often it comes up. And mark my word, the power of the insights that come from it, the practicality of those insights. If you can understand adjunctions, you are in really good shape to, to harness the power of category theory. In fact, I've heard it said that there are some prominent category theorists who argue the most important concept in category theory. It's not just categories, no, it's not category. It's not functor. It's not natural transformations. It's adjunctions. Okay, which is an interesting perspective. But it it highlights. And it's a nod to how how important they are. I don't have a dog in that fight, and but what I do know is that they're really important. They're really practical, and so applied category theory. A lot of it is about adjunctions. Okay. 
And for this reason, I provided you with a bunch of a bunch of um, resources related to adjunction. These are a lot of fun. There's actually seven of Eugenia Chang's on Senate Junctions. Um, uh, okay. Um, now, one of the reasons that that adjunctions are such an important thing to think about is that they're kind of a gateway to a lot of other key concepts in 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 uh, applied category theory. So I'm just listing some here, okay? We're gonna be concentrating the first of these, these feet and apices. And it turns out adjunctions are involved at a central level in this structure coast. We're gonna be coming back to those to explain them, but we're gonna be able to explain them much more deeply with adjunctions. But it's a lot deeper than that. It turns out adjunctions are joined at the hip with monads. Okay, every adjunction will give a monad. Mm -hmm. And monads come with adjunctions. I think often they have more than one in what's called the Kleisley category and the, and the, the uh, Eidenberg Moore category, but I'm not going to swear off that. Um, it turns out that adjunctions come up in a practical functional programming. So if any of you have taken a course in Haskell or have seen Scala, um, you may remember this thing called currying. Does anyone remember what currying is? What's what's currying? Mm -hmm. uh, argument and pass mm -hmm. it in for what it would um, go mm -hmm. to next within um, uh -huh. Within a function, it's hard to do it without like yeah. it. But so, like typically with lambda calculus, if we had an uh an argument mm -hmm. meet required for a function and we passed in another uh function or value, yeah, you could curry it and have it carry. Okay, so so you're 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 getting some key things related to it. So if we have a I, I'm gonna put it this way, if we have a function. We can uh, we can equivalently have one of two things, and and this equivalence reflects the fact there's an adjunction. You can do it this way, or or you can do the same thing in another way. What's the way? If we have a function f that takes two things x and y, mm -hmm. um, and returns a value, we can get the same effect of things we can do with it. We can instead of a function g that takes an X alone, not a Y, and it returns a function whose job in life is to take a Y and compute the result. And so we've kind of staged the computation. You split it up into two pieces. Instead of taking a pair and returning a value, you take just one of the values and you return a function whose job in life is to take the remaining value and return and, and, and return whatever needs to be computed on. So this is called currying and uncurring. That that um, uh, currying means breaking it up in this way. Uncurring would mean taking the two together, x and y. Um, it turns out that data migrations involve adjunctions. It turns out that all these monads are joined at the hip with adjunctions. Um, um, uh, divided by multiplication. Uh, less than or equal to uh, floor and ceiling, min and max, uh, L, uh, least common denominator and greatest common divisor, co-products and and products have have uh, relation to this. Uh, products and unions, um, free forgetful functors are very common. If free monoids um, come out of an adjunction um, with with set, so it turns out like adjunctions. Once you start learning category theory a bit more deeply, you almost can't avoid them. And that's why I'm gonna be, that's why it's important enough that I talk about them some. I'm I, I'm not going to, and we, it would not be fit for this course that I go into several lectures and adjunctions as I might otherwise. We'll save that for a later time. Um, you can find me commenting on it online with several lectures. Um, but it's going to be worth this time, okay? And and I list here some some additional things you can you can link up to. It turns out 
that much of what we're talking about today has a really nice um, infrastructure co span story in in double categories. Okay, so we're going to talk now about adjunctions, and I I want to talk about the slogan. Remember, the slogan is that it's a way of translating between similar categories, right? So it's going to involve not su no surprise two categories C and D. Here are two categories. Okay, it's a tale of two categories, right? Okay, and there's a trans ability to translate between them. And the way which we capture that way of translating between them is with two, what are called adjoint functors, okay? So here on the C, we have category D, sorry, category C. Here on the right, here on the left, we have category C. Here on the right, we have category D. And we have one functor that goes from C to D. That's going to be called the right functor. And I've drawn it conveniently so it goes to the right. Is that okay with you? And then there's a left functor, left adjoint, which we're going to call, so this one was R, we're going to call it the left adjoint L. Is that okay? Now, there's some conventions here. And one is this little turnstile operation, okay? That will point, when the people draw junctions, they use this to point at the little sharp point points towards the left adjoint functor. These are two adjoint functors, meaning they kind of go together. They kind of translate in opposite directions, right? Like one goes uh, English to Chinese, the other goes Chinese to English, you know, uh, right? Mm -hmm. And this points in the direction of the L1. So you know which one is the L1 if you see this turnstile. You know what the intention. And it turns out these will have quite different intuitions associated with them. They, they have really good intuitions. They do different things. Um, another convention you'll sometimes see is you point in the direction with an arrow of the left functor. So you notice this arrow is pointing in the direction of the left functor. So this is the left and this is the right. Now, you'll notice as Bartosz Milewski will point out as a junctions video, actually it may be in another video, you notice that there's a sort of asymmetry here, right? You might expect like these point down in the direction of the functor, you know, it's kind of uh, it sweeps down and this one would sweep up. No, 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 they, they, they sweep down here, okay? And we're gonna talk about the significance of that in just a minute. But these are gonna be elements of structure in these two categories that we're gonna be relating. We're gonna be, the adjunction is gonna say, hey, this structure, has a systematic mapping to this structure, that they're really, you know, saying the words in a different language. This green one is just saying it in, in the language of C, this one is saying it in the language of D, okay? So they correspond, right? Um, but do note that there are, that it's not entirely symmetric and that makes a big difference, okay? Are we okay with this? So we have these two functors, these so-called adjoint functors, a left adjoint and a right adjoint. And they have wonderful intuitions and you, you keep on coming back to them in these different categories, in these different contexts, data migrations, monads, et cetera. And you keep on seeing the same themes, like John Bies talks about L being loose, um, being free and, and allowing things to sort of um, just just be freely multiplying, whereas R is restrictive. Okay. Um, he says this is like <laughs> Republican and this is like liberal or something like that. Um, okay. Now, yes. No, no. Yes. Well, that's what we're just getting to. So, exactly. Okay. So here's this. Here's this adjunction. Good. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, those videos by Bartosz are 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 really worth worth watching for those who aren't familiar at, at these these ones and adjunctions. Quite quite nice. Um, okay, let's talk about the properties of an adjunction. So you might think, well, that's kind of weird. Okay. Um, um, thank you for telling me that. Um, but I, I want to highlight some properties that are going to be absolutely central properties and be motivating why we use adjunctions and 
why they play this role in structured postcards. Can we do this? Can we do that? Okay. So the fundamental property, so it turns out you can introduce adjunctions in two different ways that are, end up being equivalent, but they're two rather different ways. One is more related to monads and with unit and code unit and some triangle laws. Um, we're we're going to be, just for the sake of time, we're going to be focusing on the other one, okay? Which have to do with relationships between what are called homsets, okay? So I'm going to be describing a property that is guaranteed for any adjunct. Okay. And I'm going to use some notation for it. And I just want us to remember what that notation means. Okay. Um, it's going to be a, a very powerful general thing. What this is going to say is look, if you pick any object from category from the left, here, this, this category C. Okay, any object here, C from here. Any object D in the other category, you may say, what? okay, C is from, little C is from this category, D is from that category. Okay, this is kind of weird. For any pair of those, hmm, there is a isomorphism, not just an isomorphism, it turns out a natural isomorphism, which is even more powerful. Um, it's it's speaking about deep structural similarity. It's natural in two things, C and D. We won't really dwell on that this time when we introduce adjunctions more, more, more in another time we may may talk about it outside the scope of this course. But there's an a, there's an isomorphism, in fact, the natural isomorphism between get this. Okay, so we have C here, right? We have D here. And there's a isomorphism, natural isomorphism between the HOM sets involved with C and D. Do you see this? So do you remember what a HOM set is? What's a HOM set? When I say a HOM set, sounds, sounds maybe fearsome. What's a HOM set? It's, but if I talk about the HOM set between X and Y, where X is an object and Y is an object, what is the HOM set between X and Y? It's just the set of morphisms, set of morphisms from X to Y. So this is a HOM set. Do you, do you see that? So I, I want to remind you, because it may not be familiar, when we write C of this thing in parentheses, what does that mean? Well, it means the morphisms, the, the HOM set, in C, in category C, that's why C is here, between LD, look at that, see that? That's the image of D. Remember, remember we said for any C and any D, D is in, 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 in um, category D, right? Lower, lower case D. If we hit it with L, remember this is a functor, right? This here is a functor, right? This is an adjoint functor. Remember what functors do? They map objects to objects, right? Right? Morphism to morphism. So D, do you see this? This one maps over to this one here, LD. Are, are we okay with that? That's just a matter of notation. You, If you want, you can imagine parentheses around this, L of D. It's L applied to D. Remember it? takes an object, the functor maps an object to an object over here. Are we okay with that? That's what LD is. So this is the image of D under L, sort of where L maps it, okay? And what I'm saying is the HOM set, the, the set of morphisms from that to C, hmm? that's what I've shown here. That's what I've drawn out. And I use different colors for each of them. These are the set of morphisms from it. L from LD, right, to C. Do you, do you get that? That set of morphisms is in one-to-one -one correspondence with, it's isomorphic, in fact, not really isomorphic, to the set of morphisms from in D, over in D. Hmm? From D, 
down to the image of C under R, under this, this right adjoint. So, so look, I mean, this may just seem like weird, weirdly arcane, but look, look, we're talking that there's a fundamental similarity in structure, okay? And a thoroughgoing fun, um, similarity in structure that look, for any, any C here over in here, and any D that could map over here, the morphisms over here in C have to mirror the morphisms over in D from that, that guy that mapped over and the image of, of C here. So it's like the two functors have to translate between these languages, Chinese to English, English to Chinese, in ways that are compatible, right? So if I say, <laughs> I'm not going to use my Chinese. Um, but if, if, if I were to say, you know, um, this certain thing, you know, like I live on the house by the hill or something like that, um, in, in one, you'd expect it to kind of have similar structure to it over in the other language if they were really very similar systematically languages, okay? Um, so what this is saying is that the hum sets here are very similar and that these functors that go between them pick out, you know, okay, this is this is object D in, in, in category D, lowercase D in, in category D. And this is kind of serves as kind of a corresponding object over in C. Not exactly the same, but corresponding. Okay, doesn't have to be exactly the same. Um, maybe C is a much bigger category or something. Um, uh, in terms of some objects not mapped to by by L, right? Um, and then this one has to be mapped to R C. So this has this says like L and C, L and R are not. Remember what the criteria would be if they were isomorphism. What what would it mean if you, do you remember with within a given category, if you had an isomorphism between the two objects, yeah, they're inverse of each other. Remember, you have F from X to Y and G from Y to X, such that when you compose them, you get identity, right? And depending on the order, identity on X or the identity on Y. Remember that? But here, these are not inverses, but they're, they give some, they retain they preserve the structure, right? That these morphisms in this HOM set have to be in one-to-one -one correspondence with these ones. Do you get that? Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of structure over here involving things mapped to over here that mirrors the structure over here for things that can be mapped to it, right? Again, there may be things over here that are not mapped to from D, and there may be things over here that are not mapped to by C, but those things that are, they have kind of similar structure. Do you get that sense? One-to-one, mm -hmm. -one, not only one-to-one -one correspondence in terms of what natural meaning, to, I, the way I think of it is, it doesn't matter if you do your stuff over here or do it over there, you get comparable results. Remember the whole idea of naturality. You can, you can do it over here, then translate, or you can translate and then do it over there. Okay, um, I'm glossing over some things, but okay. So, so this is talking about deep, similarity between these categories. Do you get that sense? Okay, now, this isn't all, there's a lot of extra things. There's monads in here and so on, but we're not gonna be talking about them. But I will, I wanna emphasize two things will be critical for our exposition. Are we ready? One is left adjoints always preserve co-limits. What do I mean by preserve? What does that mean, preserve? When I say, or I, I sometimes use the word honor, what does it mean? Let's just think, you know, in concrete terms, what does it mean to preserve colonies? They don't change, okay. So if I have a colonies, let's say, give me an example of a colonies. There's a lot of things that fall into colonies. Um, give me one example of it. A push out is a colonies. A co product is a is a color turns out an initial object is a, you know, right okay let's so if there were a co-product over here what would it mean for l to preserve it suppose there were a 
a coproduct structure over in D, what would it mean that L preserves it? Yeah, so when when we follow it, if we, we consider, okay, there's a coproduct here. Remember, there's like an object here, object here, the injection morphisms up. When we hit it with L, it translates into a what over here? Into a coproduct over here. That's what it means to preserve it. Do you get that idea? Mm -hmm. To preserve mean it it honors it. It transports it over. So if there's a coproduct over here, L will make a coproduct over here. Okay. And well, R doesn't preserve, isn't guaranteed to preserve co-limits. It's guaranteed to preserve limits in the other direction. Are we okay with this? Product, it would transport products over. This one will transport co-products over. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Pullbacks will be will be preserved by R. Um, uh, pushouts will be preserved by L. Mm -hmm. Okay, that turns out to be absolutely central for structure cospan. Okay, okay, and here we are in structure cospan land. Okay, so let's talk about <laughs> let's talk about these things. Remember we were talking about them earlier. Remember, um, sorry, remember this thing. Okay, you're going to recognize. See, make a note of this. Okay, just just look at this. We have L of A, L of B, and X, and then and then here we have A, B, and R. Watch this. You ready? In fact, I'm gonna I'm gonna make a copy of this. Don't mind if I do, and I'm gonna paste it in just uh, above this so you can. I can just flip back and forth without make you dizzy. Okay, do you recognize this? L of A, L of B, and X? Mm -hmm. Do you recognize this? A, B, R of X? Okay, now I didn't want to confuse you, but it was easiest to, thought it would be confusing if the cospans were upside down. And so I put R up here at the top. I kept it in red, but I made it up at the top, right? But still, uh, L is going this way. Like left adjoint is going this way, just like it did before. It just I, I put it down at the bottom just so because it, it was mapping these. Things. Okay. So so this R and L, those are adjoints. Those are the adjoints. Okay. And L preserves coproducts, preserves co-limits, and more generally. Okay. Um, and we're going to be using that. Okay, so let's talk about this structured co-span. So do you remember before I said, when I looked at this before, I said, really, these are two faces of this. Yeah. These are two kind of facets of it, right? Two sides of the coin. Look at this. You, you can kind of see why. Because remember the slogan, adjunctions are like translations between categories. This is... What we see over here on the left, this guy here is like the translation of this under when when we hit it, uh, you know, when we hit it with L for the for these uh, here, right? And this guy here is like the corresponding thing to this over uh, over in this category. Are we okay with that? Okay, now let, let's let's. Don't get get ahead of ourselves. Let's uh, further reflect on what is this. Remember this key condition? Remember this really powerful condition down here? Do you remember that? About the hom sets being kind of the same. Potato, potato, tomato, tomato, sort of translation between them, right? Mm -hmm. Corollary, corollary, um, right? Um, Okay, so you see the same thing here, right? I think you're getting a sense I colored these things. This is orange, the corresponding one over here is orange. This one is green, the corresponding one over here is green. Do you get that sense? So these are kind of translations, but watch this, watch this. This property down here, what does it translate into here? Watch this. So read off to me. Oh, I'm sorry. Ah, this should be X. Okay, okay. Now I'm in bad trouble. Sorry, sorry, folks. But um, I'm just going to put this in here. This is X. And forgive me if I don't put it in fancy, fancy 
you know, script right now. This is X and this is A, okay? I've made them specific here for the example, but this is A, this is X, okay? So this is our, remember A is the what category. It's the simpler category. That's why it's simple. It's the beginning of the alphabet, right? A, A, B, C, right? Um, And X is at the far side, right? Right? Oh, that's a good way to yeah. It, 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 X is on the far side. Like X is lots of stuff and it's lots of, it's much further down. It's much more evolved, right? Um, It's got all these different things in it. That's why it's an X. It's got all these things coming together, right? So this would be like, it might be set, right? This might be as simple as set, but this is something with more structure like graphs. Mm -hmm. Okay, but watch this. Because of this property, hmm, what does that translate into here? Well, we just have to think about this property. For any C here, right? And for any D here, we get this property, right? So let's 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 think about it, right? Um, okay, so for any C here, um uh so we might have this one here, for example, right? This this C. Um, we have this fundamental similarity. Maybe for D, we'll go with A. Okay. So let's. This has to hold for any C in this category. For any D in this category, right? This this similarity palm sets here, right? Has to hold. So so let's do this. So let's most this is C. And let's suppose this is D, right? What is it saying? Well, it's saying this, okay? So the Homs from this guy here to X are in one-to-one, -one, in fact, natural isomorphism to the Homs from A to R of X. Mm -hmm. So they're really kind of the same thing, potato to a potato tomato tomato it's just a different it's 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 kind of corresponding ones i'll say it that way right and i think you could see the same thing holds for this right um with with this these are in one-to-one -one correspondence with this mm -hmm. just through that same problem all i'm doing is i'm i'm applying this when c is x and when d is A or D is B here. Are we okay with that? So what I'm saying is the fact that I'm saying that this is kind of the the corresponding one just reflects this. There's this, just like here, there's a black one here and there's a black one here. They correspond, get it? They're in one-to-one -one correspondence. This hom is in one-to-one -one correspondence. These, to the degree there's multiple homs here, they're in one-to-one -one correspondence with this one. They're sort of a corresponding. Do you get that? So this is why I say these are like two sides of the same coin. We can talk about it over in this category X, the complicated category, the category lots of bells and whistles and lots of lots of good stuff going on. Stocks and dynamic variables or auxiliary variables and, and you know constants and some variables and flows and and you know uh, lengths. Or we could talk about it in this simple category just as stocks, just, just as a set of stocks. Are we okay with this idea? Mm -hmm. So it's kind of the, the corresponding structure, okay? Are, are we okay with this fundamental idea that, that this corresponds to this? Technically, John calls this the structured code span, but this is another way of, I think I'll say you can... Alternatively, you can view it as in the other category, the category A, the simple category, as, as this one here. Are we okay with this notion? Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's why it's important these are adjoint functors. That's one reason. But there's another reason, and it will have to do with this preserved co-limits, okay? Because that's going to let us do an amazing thing. Okay. Are we okay? Okay. 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 Now... So let's let's talk about this. So what would this look like for a structured co-span? I, I tried to envision it for a particular category. Here are the left category is the category of graphs. Okay. 
So I, I just want to make sure we're on the same page. What is an object in this category? I, I want to distinguish. This is not the category of GR. This is not the schema category for graphs. This is the category of graphs. What are the objects in the category of graphs? They are graphs. What are morphisms? So this is a graph, this is a graph, this is a graph. Hmm? This is X the graph. Hmm? This is L of A the graph. Hmm? They're graph homomorphisms. Okay. Here we are over in set. And this is A. That's so that's X. That's the fancy Nancy category. So these connections between things. Here's here's our on the right hand side. This is our category for the feet. Mm -hmm. Simple category, less structure. And this is gonna be fin set. Mm -hmm. Finite sets. Okay. So what are the objects in fin set? They are sets. And finite sets, in fact. And morphisms are functions between sets. Are we okay with that? So what would it mean that these have correspondence? Well, okay. I mean, really pretty cool. Okay. So over here, we know all these objects right up front. They are they are what? All the objects in fin sets are sets, right? All the objects over here in graphs are graphs. But the really interesting thing in category theory, of course, are the morphisms, right? Okay, so let's talk about them. So, but let's talk about this more. I want to think what these particular sets are, okay? Okay, so we, we could start in either direction. I'm going to imagine, okay, this is our morphism. Uh, this is our graph for X, okay? Are, are we okay? Those, these are graphs, right? Our graph for X. Were you okay with that? What would the... What would the right adjoint, when we hit it with the right adjoint, this is what's called a forgetful functor. It forgets most of its structure as defined by the morphisms. And we have to get out a category. Guess what that category is going to be? The category of what? It's going to forget about the edges. It's just going to be the, it's going to be the set of vertices. Okay. By the way, don't get caught up that like, oh, this has objects within it. And no, no, this object is just a graph. Don't, don't, don't worry about how it's encoded. You, you don't have to worry about that. And, and you'll get caught up in level confusions if you worry about it. This is just a graph. Okay. It's an object, it's just an infinitesimal thing. Don't worry about how it's encoded. Okay. That graph is going to be mapped into a set, which is going to be the set of vertices in that graph. That's what the right adjoint is going to do. Right adjoints often have this notion. When we said like the uses, there's all these cases, and this is one of them, where there's a notion of a free and forgetful. So this is a forgetful functor. It forgets about some things here, and all it does is extract the set, okay? And I'm going to call that set one, two, three, four. Where did I get one, two, three, four from? Four, four vertices. Are we okay with that? And I even colored them, if it's okay, by the rough color here. I, I tried to make it less bright because I figure it'd be hard to read the thing, but one, three, and four, I call this one, two, three, four. Two is orange and so on, just, just so you could see the correspondence, okay? Are we okay with that? So when we hit this graph with this, it sucks out the, it, it, it maps it to a set, it doesn't suck it out, it, it maps it to a set, with ju that's just a set of vertices. Are we okay with that? Okay. And and here, so that's what the right functor is going to do here. It's a forgetful functor, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, the left functor is going to do something appropriately enough kind of funky, okay? Uh, functory, okay? Um. So the left functor is going to map an object over in this simpler category, this category of the feet, this category of fin set. It's going to map that over into this category here on the left. What is the, So it's going to map an object here on the right. What is an object here on the right? It's a what? It's a set. And it's going to map. So L is a functor from fin set over here to graph. So it's going to map this object on the right to be a what on the left? What does it need to be to be an object on the left? A graph. 
you could say like, what the heck? Like, what? how can the set be an object? Well, it's like the simplest possible graph. It's the canonical graph associated with the set. It's the graph that has what? That as its set of vertices and no morphisms between them. No morphisms. That's why this one goes to a single vertex. That's why this one goes to three vertices, but no links between them, no edges between them. Are we okay with that idea? So that's what L does here. It it kind of promotes the set to be like this trivial graph with like with that many vertices. Are we okay with that? Mm -hmm. So those are the actions of L and R. And, and it turns out that those are adjoint actions, that those satisfy this adjointness relationship. But let's talk about the morphisms, okay? Mm -hmm. So what does this morphism over here do? What's the job over here in FinSet? Remember, remember you have to talk about morphisms because functors, we've been dealing with functors mapping objects, but really the interesting thing is how functors map morphisms. After all, that's how they preserve structure, by preserving composition and preserving identity. So what is, what is this morphism? Let's just go in our heads. What's this morphism on the right here doing? This morphism from the set one to the set one, two, three, four. What is it doing? Well, it maps from this set. So for every value of this set, it has to map it to a value from this set. And what value is it going to map it to? Guess what? Two. That's why it's orange. Hmm? Hmm? And if you wonder why, well, it's because this maps to vertex two, but um, over here, right? Okay. Um, one, two, and three for value for one. What does it map to? Index. So it maps to one. Two maps to three. Three maps to four. Exactly. So that's a function. And what I'm saying is that function maps over one to one correspondence to what this does. Hmm? That for every one function that go this goes to the second one here, all this does is map this to the second vertex here. Hmm. And every one here has a corresponding one here, right? If this were to go to the first vertex, there'd be a function that maps this to the first vertex. You, you comfortable with that notion? And similarly, this mapping here, for every possible mapping here, there's a corresponding mapping that just maps these to the corresponding vertices. Do you, do you get that sense? That's why there's a one-to-one -one correspondence. Are we okay with this? So these are structured coast maps. Okay. And this is going to be our feet category. This is going to be our category at the apex. Okay. And we can think of it as kind of in this category with these promoted things that are graphs, but they're kind of weird runt graphs. They're weird sort of trivial graphs. Do we get that sense? I mean, I mean, I, I don't want to demean them. I mean, they're, they just don't have any edges, right? They're, they're just kind of you know, sim bog simple graphs. Are we okay with that? Um, uh, and this will sort of just map it to the set of vertices. We're we're okay with this, right? And you can kind of have a sense why there's a one to one correspondence. There's no wiggle room here, right? Like anything that maps. If this mapped to four, if this were to map to four, where would the corresponding one map this guy to? To vertex four. Hmm. If this guy were to map to two, this guy would map to two, which it does. Are we okay? So there's no wiggle room here, right? You can see, kind of get a sense why there's a correspondence. Okay, so you might think, well, that's, that's kind of weird. But yeah, okay, sure. There's this correspondence and structure. And you might believe me if I told you L preserves colimits. But now let's put these facts to work, can we? This is just to orient us, okay? And now... We're going to have, here's our co-spans. Which category am I showing this in? The left one or the right here? What does this look like? Which one? This one or that one? Which one am I depicting it in? Is this, yeah, it's in graph. It's in X. This is an X, right? I should say like in, ah, okay. I can't say anything. Um, okay. Uh, here we go. Come on. Um, okay. This is in, in, 
in category category X. Are we okay with that? Okay. Um, and and that will carry through for the next month. Okay, so here's L of A. Do you recognize these ones here? Do you recognize these? Do you recognize the same same pictures here? Right? You you okay with that? Is this the the structure of Coast Man? I think you might be right. What's that? I said you might be right. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um. So what are these morphisms? Just to make sure we're we're on the same page. What are these morphisms over here in graph? In graph, they're graph homomorphisms, right? Then you might say, well, they're kind of funky in this case because it's it's these, but they are graph homomorphisms. They can pick and choose where these things go to freely, right? Mm -hmm. It's free, right? They can pick and choose these to go anywhere here. There's really no constraints. It's free. Free, forgetful. Forgetful, free, you know? Okay, now, so here's our... These are graph homomorphisms. We're, we're comfortable with that? Yeah. This is all over an X. We're going to be talking about this. We're going to be focusing on X from now on. Are we okay? Okay. Here we go. Mm -hmm. Here's X. Now, suppose we had that cospan. And suppose we had this cospan. We're going to talk about composing cospans now. Okay. All, that's all over. You could think of it all of, uh, going on over here. So we're going to comp compose them. Okay. Here we go. And so this is a cospan one, this is cospan two, also in X. Okay. So this is a little graph, and we can find where it maps to. It's a graph homomorphism, right? This is a graph homomorphism, right? We can pick does this guy go to the last one or does it go to the this one or this one? Right? We can we go okay with this. So imagine that you have these cospans, this one in X and this one in X. Mm -hmm. Can we compose them? How do we compose them? This is how we compose them. All right, so this is our first one. Oops, you recognize that, I think, right? This this guy here, it's also this guy. But this one here is this one here. And we're gonna put them side by side. And you notice that I've artfully, or not so on art, I mean, it's quite it's horrible art, um, I've made this one the same, L of B, L of B. So they have a one in common. So they share this in common, right? Again, what are these morphisms here? This is all an X. What are these morphisms? They are what? Yeah. Grab homomorphisms. Okay. Okay, so we have this one here. We have this one here. And Xiaoyan last time helped you realize that when you stick these like this, this forms the basis of a push-out square, right? We have G and we have H. And it's a push-out square here in the category of graphs, right? And so that push-out, this is injection two, this is injection one. These are graph homomorphisms, right? That just kind of you know, stick it in there, stick it in there, yeah. Um, and, or, and, and this will identify mm, the things that are in green here with the things that are in green here. You get that notion? That this is where the green things go here. This is where the green things go there. And we are identifying those things. We are saying those are the same. Mm? So it's like we glue this to this. It's like we glue this to this this to that. We okay with that? And then by virtue of taking the push out, those two things are glued together. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so this one has gotten to this one and this one went to that one. So there's a now a morphism, right? From this all the way over to this. And that's what this one is. Mm -hmm. And then there's a morphism because this one went to here. There's a morphism from this. This one is like the same as this one. This one is the same as this one. So now there's a morphism between these two right here. Are we okay with that? Mm -hmm. And this one is still kind of at the center. Mm -hmm. You know, are we okay with that? You notice push out is operating here, but here's the other thing. 
check this out. Now we have compositionality. These feet are like the interfaces. These feet are like the handles. These feet are like the ports, the, the place we can plug things in. We went from something from A to B and from something from B to C, and now we have something from A to C. And we we do, we, we have a whole structured co-span. Do you see that? So again, what are these morphisms here? They are what? This is in the category graph. So these, they're graph homomorphisms. And so can we compose graph homomorphisms? You bet you can. You better bet you can. In fact, it's in this category um, here, uh, like these are graphs and these are graph homomorphisms, right? And you can compose them. Um, there's a whole category for it, right? Um, that's the category graph. So we can compose F with this injection to get a map up here, right? And we can compose J and then do I uh, iota two, right? To inject in there and have this. And this whole thing forms a what? What am I drawing for the red? It forms a, begins with C, structure cosmet. Yeah, it's a structure cosmet. Do you see that? So we composed something that went, a structure cosmet went from A to B. We could kind of think about A as the input port, B is the output port. Went from B to L, uh, from B to C, you think of, or yeah, um, um, from, uh, and now it goes from A to C, you know? or L of A to L of C here. Are we okay with this? Okay. Um, so now we have this compositionality. I began this talk. I began this, this class noting that we have all these open systems, but systems are compositional. And I held this up. And if I, if I had better presence of mind, I would have brought something that plugs the display port into this one here, right? And, and I could have shown how by composing them, you have two things on the far side, right? But um, I argued that they're compositional. We want these compositional structures and they surround us in life for good engineering reasons, but just it's the reality of, of living in the world that we, we deal with compositionality all the time without even thinking so much about it. And we wanted to be able to capture that. And now we've captured this here. We have these handles in the form of feet. These feet are these interfaces, right? These ports, these handles on these systems. Okay, now there's a further story here. And I would urge you to watch John Bice's talks on this. He has some wonderful talks on these things. This is one of the oldest ones, but he walks through it very, very systematically. Um, uh, there's some newer talks for the ACT conference and for the Topos Institute. Uh, and all of these, I think, go into double categories, which I'm not going to be able, be able to get to today, okay? Even though there's a beautiful story there. But the other component that I want to emphasize but, but beyond composing these is just as, is, 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 is very, very important and probably just as important. And it has to do with tensoring two things. Mm -hmm. Tensoring involves putting them in parallel, okay? putting one graph like down next to another graph. Are we okay with that? And the way we're going to interpret that is as co-product. Do you remember this idea that like with co-products, remember the, the um, Tinker Toy thing, you just put them next to each other? At co-limit, you stick them together. The push out, you, you stick them together. But co-product, you just put them down next to each other. That was sort of John Weiss's analogy. And we're going to interpret tensor as that, okay? So when we tensor things, when we kind of put down structured coast bands, we're gonna take the co-product, the co-product of their pieces. Now, now watch this, this is gonna be a key thing, okay? Um, so we're gonna take the co-product of these two coast bands, okay? Okay, so let's get going. Okay, you take the co-product of X and X prime, you get X plus X prime, right? You're, you're comfortable with co-product being denoted as plus, right? Um, you take the co-product of L of A and L of A prime, and you get L of A plus L of A prime. Are we okay with that? Take the co-product of L of B and L of B prime, you get L of B 
plus L of B prime, right? And you could take the coproduct is functorial, meaning it can be applied to morphisms. And all it does is take the coproduct of the appropriate morphisms, okay? Mm -hmm. So there we go. But we have a problem now. Is this a, if, if I just looked at this, I wish I had a way to like cover it, <laughs> cover <laughs> cover this up. Um, if I just looked at this, is this a structured cosmic? Oh, it's not a structure goes in. We need like L of something at the bottom. We need like L of, you know, some X or, or not X, L of some something, right? L of elephant, um, right? Um, at the bottom and we don't have that. We have L of A plus L of B. What are we going to do? Well, at Excuse me, right. you are muted. Transports over these things that L applied to A plus A prime is the cell of same as L of A plus L of A prime, right? It honors it. A coproduct here in the category A. This is A, little a and little a prime are in the category A, a category A, right? L of this whole thing is in the category X, but but because L transports copra, because it honors them, because it preserves them, L of A plus A prime is the same as L of A plus L of A prime, right? Do you, do you get that notion? It just, if, if you take it on a coproduct over an A, it turns it into a coproduct in X when you transport it over with L. It just goes over there. Do you get that idea? Now, the beautiful thing about that is, now let's cover up something else. Um, come on, come on, cover this up. Um, now we have something that looks like an honest to goodness what? What is this? If we compose this in this, what do we have here? It's a structured co-span because we have an L of something down here and we have an apex that's up here. Do you get that? It's a thing of beauty and a joy forever, right? Do you see that? Yeah. And that's that also comes with this use of adjunctions, okay? So adjunctions are serving in many useful ways. The other thing is, John, John Bice commented that when they're dealing with like decorated co-spans and, and approaches, which kind of had it over here and some decoration up here when you have operations here you always have to worry is this still a legitimate one but if you operate over here it all it, you know you're, you're always getting just objects in here just fine you don't have to worry that it's rendered invalid somehow by the operations over here um okay so um one of the things and, and I, I'm, I'm i'm just taking you know, uh, horribly from, from John's slides here um, and crediting him. But um, these slides are from him and I'm just, you know, pointing some things occasionally out. So he deserves all this credit at, the, at this uh, link. You could see his talk. The key theorem here, which was proven by his grad student, Kenny Corser and him is, um, look, if A and X are, are categories with finite co-limits and L from A to X is a left adjoint, right? Think... This is a left adjoint, right? That means there is a right adjoint, but they don't have to get into specifically that here. Um, uh, then there's a symmetric monoidal category. Now, this is this is actually important. Don't don't quite let your eyes glaze over yet. Um, there's a symmetric monoidal category where an object is an object of A, like one of these, and the morphisms are. Isomorphism classes of structured cosmets. Okay, no, <laughs> we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna um, brush, we're gonna, not gonna go too deep into this, but these, you could think of, you could be forgiven for thinking of them first blushes. Oh, this is, this is some structured cospans going between them. Not, remember before we talked about this, remember much earlier I said, hey, there's this category, these are objects of A, and what are these things? 
they're morphisms of A, right? But now these are objects of A and these are isomorphism classes of structured co-spans, um, which have these, this is a foot and this is a foot. It's going from this foot to this foot. Mm -hmm. uh, this foot to this foot, okay? Um, now, uh, what do I mean by isomorphism classes? Well, two structure co-spans are considered isomorphic. So why do we need this whole thing with uh, isomorphism classes? Well, John said, look, you know, I, I, I talked with him about this on, on Zool um, yesterday. And, and he said, look, um, or he confirmed that basically the deal is if it's a category, right? If, if we have a category, we expect composition to hold, as we say, on the nose. If we compose this and this, we get something that composes to this. And the problem is that structured co-spans, you, you actually don't get composition, as we say, on the nose. It's only up to isomorphism. And if I had a marker, I'd put it on the board. But um, you may recognize this as, as, as a common kind of annoyance of... <laughs> Thanks a lot. Sometimes I feel terrible. Um, uh, if we had, if we have, and, and I'm not indicating these as objects here, but if we have, and I'm just trying to use an analogy for expressions. Uh, if we have x plus y plus z, and compared to, you know, x plus y plus z, um, someone could be forgiven for saying, you know. Um, these are basically the same, and 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 the truth is they're not exactly the same, but there's a direct correspondence between them, right? For every one of these, there's one of these, and every one of these, there's one of these, and you can go interchangeably from one to the other, f and g, such that f, well, we could even write, you know, as f minus one, right? Um. So we can go, they have the same information. Do you get, do you understand that? But they're not exactly the same. And in a category, in a category, composition needs to be what? Composition needs to be, begins with an A, associative. Has to be associative. So if I have, you know, I, and then that looks like that. I semicolon fat semi uh colon uh j semicolon k, right? Um this needs it, it needs to not matter where I put the parentheses. If I first do um if I first do I fat semi meaning f, you know, and, and ah, ah, that's a j. Okay, is there a there it really? Okay, thank you. Thank you. I'm, I'm hopeless. Um there we go. There's a J. Um if I do this first and then K, that has to be precisely the same as what? For it to be associative. First uh, Yeah, first first uh, I and then fat semi, and then J and, and, and K. And you could think of this one if you want as, as being done first. But this has to be exactly the same for a category, right? It's associative. It gives us all sorts of nice, not have to worry about the parentheses, right? Mm -hmm. That's not the case here. So we'd like, we'd like a category of structured coast fails. We, we'd really, really like one where the objects are the objects of A and the morphisms are the structured co-spans between them, but we we don't get this property because composing them, it, it turns out, is not associative on the nose. It's kind of iso up to isomorphism, but it's, it's, it's not on the nose. So what do they have to do? Well, they have to say, thanks a ton of this. That's just so great. Um, they they have to say we're going to deal with isomorphism class. So what does it mean for two structure co-spans to be isomorphic? See this? Do you see this? Uh, 
in a symmetric monoidal category. That's true. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's exactly right. The symmetric monoidal, and often that's of strong interest here. But but let's just let's just deal with what. That, so so this diagram is is indicating the conditions under which two structure cospans are are uh, isomorphic. Where are the structure cospans? This is one of them. L A, L B, and X. Right? You re you recognize that as a structure cospan, right? This is another one, just shown upside down, right? This is again from from John, just directly you see a slide, and um, these two are considered isomorphic if there's a if there's a function f such that these two commute. This, um, excuse me, this one is the same as this, and this one is the same as that. What? And you might say, well, that's kind of funky. What what is that really? Want? Well, look, look, it's not it's not that bad if you think about it. Okay, look, if you if if you're LMB and then you you go into okay, so so you have this say a homomorphism into this, and then you f you could think of f as changing the name of the vertices in the graph. Uh, you know, so what what is Vertex four is now vertex one, and vertex what was vertex one is now vertex four. Just changing the the numbering. Mm -hmm. That's what f is. Mm -hmm. Um. So if you go into that, and then you change the numbering, it's the same as just going directly into this. If that's the case, then then um this square will commute. Okay. Um. This is just going to be a renumbering, a shuffling of the numbering, a permutation of the numbering. And the same thing with, with this one. It's just going to be a, a shuffling of, of the numbering um, that will allow this, this uh, to commute. Okay. So this gives some, I haven't explained that very well, but it gives some constraints for them to be considered isomorphic that really, you know, arose by the same name as just as Swede. It's Potato, potato, tomato, tomato, right? Um, so what I'm saying is we can consider isomorphism, which are a whole set that are isomorphic. And then we don't have to worry about is it is it is it associative up to isomorphism because isomorphism is built in. It's 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 an isomorphism class. So it it it, it just getting to any of the isomorphic things um and, and you have it okay and so then it will be exactly isomorphic it'll be the same class of of isomorphic things and and this is kind of an annoying thing it turns out john buys if you listen to this gives that as a motivation for using double categories where you don't have to worry about this and it's beautiful and the horizontal morphisms called pro arrows are structured cospans, not isomorphism classes, structured cospans. The vertical morphisms in the other direction are homomorphisms between them. And you can think of a structured cospan as a category, as an object, but also as a morphism that can be composed. And it's a beautiful thing, and we will get to it, I promise you, at some point, but probably not in this class, um, except maybe like in the term if we had any extra. Okay, so um, I know that's been a bit of a whirlwind thing. I give naturality and you know so what it means for natural isomorphisms, and and I don't have time to go into this, but um, we will return to adjunctions some other time, and we will explore their relationship to monads. We will explore their relationship to to other free forgetful constructions like free monoids um, and set. We will look at Galois connections, which provide these really powerful tools for compiler analysis, et cetera, and abstract interpretation. There's just this profusion of things that come from, from adjunctions. But here, structure code spans derive bread and butter advantages by taking advantage of these per, these properties of being able to preserve co-limits, for example, um, and be able to view these things on the one side of the coin as operating in 
in a fancier category with bells and whistles on the you know x and then on the other side with the simpler category x okay so we didn't get to the practical example i promise we'll do that on thursday and you'll see all this illustrated okay you might want to download that and play around with it and see if you can get it because i actually go through there and we look at the little example that i just showed we look at exactly this example of of these things okay and and you can see it's not quite as colorful but what it lacks in color it makes up for a utility okay wonderful okay let's all wish again the very best with with their her interview i think she's probably uh underway thank you everyone <laughs>